Well, what's up, Mission, and any of you that are joining us online, so excited to just be here in this space um, together today as we continue um, in this series called Against all odds. And man, we've felt like that, haven't we? For a number of different reasons over the last seven months, for many of us, we've found ourselves feeling like, man, the odds are just kind of stacked against us. And the good news is, as we've been discovering in this series, as we look at the stories of real life people who also had the odds stacked against them, people like Joseph, people like Gideon, that we still have a God who works against all odds. We have a God who shows up. We have a God who is able to do the impossible. And I love that. And I'm so excited to get to continue in this series today and teach on one of my absolute favorite stories. So if you've been around mission, let me say in the last six years, you've probably heard me teach this story before. And I'm pumped to get to teach it again because I love what God does and how he brings out new things and new insights because his word, like we all know, it's alive and it is active. And so I'm just hoping that God would bring something new and fresh to you today. As we jump into this story, it's definitely an against all odds kind of story about a young woman named Esther. And if I could use one word to describe her story, kind of this mini series, this book of Esther, it would be drama, okay? It's got wild parties and beauty pageants and murder conspiracy and social networking and defiance and challenge and risk and egos and plotting and planning and brilliance and triumph and defeat and twists and turns. Like there is nothing boring about this girl's story. And so since it is such a dramatic kind of book, kind of like last week, it's binge-worthy. It's a binge-worthy kind of thing. I thought we'd also break it down into some different scenes as we follow along today. So we'll start with scene one, which we're calling The Hangover. Okay, scene one, chapter one, the beginning tells us that there's this king named Xerxes. And he's in power of 127 provinces. He's the ruler at the time of the Persian Empire, which is the most powerful empire in the world, which would make him the most powerful man in the world. And he knew it. And being the most powerful man in the world, he knew how to do a lot of things, including throw a party. So scene one, chapter one begins with King Xerxes throwing this huge, massive party. Like everybody who was anybody was there. All the officials, the nobles from every province, military leaders, everybody was there. And it tells us, Esther chapter one, verse four, that for a full 180 days, he displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. And you think you've pulled some all-nighters, right? This party that Xerxes threw in honor of himself lasted half the year. And if 180 days wasn't long enough, when all that was over, the king threw another party, like a special VIP kind of banquet in Susa. And at this banquet, this week-long party at the end of the half-a-year party, by the king's edict during these seven days, no limits are placed on drinking. Like usually everybody could drink, you know, if the king makes a toast and everyone takes a drink, but not this week. Everybody could have as much as they wanted. And so on the last day of the event, when King Xerxes, verse 10 tells us, was high in spirits from wine, you know, which I think may be an understatement after 186 day kegger. um, But what he does when he's high in spirits from wine is he sends some of his men to go get his queen Vashti and to bring her out wearing the royal crown. And many scholars believe wearing only the royal crown because it says he wanted the nobles and all the other men to gaze on her beauty, for she was a very beautiful woman. Well, Queen Vashti was not down with that. They go to get her to to come on display and she refuses to come. Well, this made the king furious And he burns with anger. And so he sends some advisors to figure out, like, what does he do with Queen Vashti, this queen that's now disobeying his order? And they suggest that he just banish her. Like, let's just have Vashti banished. And it says in verse 19, also, just let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. They're all going, man, you could do better. And so they propose this search. 
that would be made in every province of Xerxes' realm. Let's round up all the beautiful young virgins in every province of your realm. Let's give them beauty treatments, and then let's let the girl that you like the most be made queen instead of Ashti. And so Esther 2 verse 4 says, this advice appealed to the king. You think? And so he followed it, which brings us to scene two, The Bachelor. So we've got all of these beautiful young virgins being rounded up and brought to the citadel of Susa. I mean, I can only imagine how many want to be queen. But there was only one rose, only one crown to be handed out. And it tells us that before a girl's turn came in to go into King Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the women. Six months with oil and myrrh, and six months with perfume and cosmetics. I mean, that's a long time to get ready for a date, okay? I mean, 12 months is a long time. And some of you are going, man, that sounds awesome. Give me that year, like extended spa treatment. That sounds amazing. But imagine actually being there. Like, think about this. This is a lot of girls, A lot of young women all in the same place, getting these beauty treatments, all trying to get the same crown. I mean, think about the jealousy in that house. Think about the competition. Think about the comparing going on. I mean, this was made for reality TV. And among this group of young women was this girl named Esther, a Jewish orphan girl who had been raised by her cousin Mordecai. So Mordecai is this Jewish man that he was taken captive from Jerusalem under the rule of King Nebuchadnezzar back in the day. And now he's no longer in captivity, like, but like many Jewish people, they're just kind of displaced and scattered all throughout the region. They don't really have a home. And I love Mordecai. I think it's so cool how he cares for his cousin throughout her life. It tells us in verse 7 that when her father and mother died, it was Mordecai who adopted her into his family and he raised her as his own daughter. And then in verse 11, after Esther's been taken to the bachelor pad, it says every day Mordecai would just, you know, take a walk near the courtyard of the harem to find out about Esther and what was happening to her. He cared about her. He had taken care of her. He wanted to protect her. He loved her. And that's why he instructed Esther, hey, when you go into this place, just a pointer, keep your family heritage, like your Jewish background, a a secret. Like that's not going to win you any points. We used to be in captivity. Now we're just scattered around. So just don't lead with that. Keep that a secret, he tells her. And so she did. And of all the beautiful young women brought to Susa, Verse 15 tells us that Esther, just as she was, won the admiration of everyone who saw her, including the king. It had been four years since the night that he banished Queen Vashti. And I'm sure there were plenty of young women he could have chosen, but it was Esther who won his favor. And so he set a royal crown on her head and he made her queen instead of Vashti. At the end of the day, Esther, the Jewish orphan girl raised by her displaced cousin, maybe the most unlikely, won the rose. Scene three, criminal minds. Unlike, you know, Cinderella, this is not like, and they lived happily ever after. No, there are a few criminal minds in this story, and the plot kind of thickens. The the criminal minds in this story are Bigthana, Teresh, and a guy named Haman. And interestingly enough, Mordecai ends up being the lead undercover investigator in all of these cases. You see, Mordecai had this job at the king's gate. And one day while he's working at the king's gate, he overhears two of the king's guards plotting to assassinate the king, Bigthana and Teresh. Well, Mordecai, he's got somebody on the inside, right? He's got Esther. So he tells Esther to report it to the king. And so she does, and they, they dig around, they find out that this was actually true. These guys were plotting to assassinate the king, and so they, they lost their lives. And it tells us in Esther 2.23 that the whole case, that all of this was recorded in the book of history of King Xerxes' reign. We're going to come back to that. I just want you to know that Mordecai saving these two, the king's life from these two guards, it was written down. Then there was the criminal mind of Haman, And man, just like most great villains, Haman's on the inside, you know? He's like the right-hand guy to the king, and the king has no idea. He's the highest-ranking official other than the king throughout the entire empire. 
I mean, his position is so high that when he passes by other officials, they bow down to him, except for this one guy, this Jewish man who believed in only bowing to God, Mordecai. So day after day, what happens is Haman, he passes by the king's gate and everybody bows, but Mordecai doesn't. And this makes Haman furious. In fact, he's so filled with rage. One day he's just like, I got to do something about this. And so it says in Esther 3, 6, that he learned of Mordecai's nationality. So he decided it was not enough to lay hands on Mordecai alone. Instead, he looked for a way to destroy all Jews throughout the entire empire of Xerxes. So what he does is in the month of April, he casts lots. He rolls the dice to see what would be a good day on the calendar to annihilate the entire Jewish people in all of these provinces. And they land on March 7th, almost a year later, like looked like a good day, schedule was free. He's like, this is the day I wanna do it. I'm so furious. So he goes to the king to get him to sign off on his plan. And he just explains to him that there's a certain group of people and they worship differently and they have different values, and they keep separate different laws. And he convinces the king, man, we would be better off with their money and their belongings. And the king just tells him, hey, the money and the people are both yours to do with as you see fit. And so later that week, on April 17th, a decree was written, and it was translated into the language of each province and sent with messengers to deliver them giving the order that all Jews, young and old, including women and children, must be killed, slaughtered, and annihilated on a single day. This was scheduled to happen on March 7th of the next year. Can you imagine? I mean, this is horrific. This is an evil plan from the mind of an evil man. I mean, can you imagine what this must have been like for the Jewish people to have these messengers ride up into town and bring this news? And on the front page, it reads, on March 7th, every Jew, young and old, must be killed. Can you imagine what it must have been like to have a date on the calendar? 11 months to anticipate your death, the death of your family, those closest to you? Well, as this news spread, the entire Jewish community began to weep and wail. And they put on burlap and ashes, which was this traditional manner that they had of mourning and crying out to God, asking him, please intervene, please save us. And Esther 4.1 tells us that when Mordecai learned about the whole story and all that had been done, he too tore his clothes and he put on burlap and ashes and he went out into the city crying with a loud and bitter wail. Well, the news of Mordecai weeping and wailing at the king's gate, laying in sackcloth, that travels up to Esther. So she sends a messenger to find out what in the world is wrong with her cousin, with her adopted father. And Mordecai relays the entire story to Esther and he also asked Hattach, to direct her, go to the king and beg for mercy and plead for her people. And Esther sent back a reply that went something like this. You have got to be kidding me. I I can't do that. I mean, everyone knows that going to the king uninvited is against the law. And then the punishment is death. She says, I mean, the only exception is if when he sees me, he holds out his gold scepter, but I don't see that happening. Like we've been married for five years now and he hasn't asked for me in 30 days, if you know what I'm saying. Like not a good time for me to show up and just, you know, ask the king for some favors, like reveal my secret heritage I've never told him about. This is too much for you to ask of me. The punishment is death. It's too risky. And Esther had to believe that her response would be sufficient that Mordecai would, would just go, you're right, I'm so sorry. That is way too risky, too, too much to ask. I'm so sorry. But instead, Mordecai sent this reply to Esther. Don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape when all other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, 
Deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this. Not what Esther was expecting to hear. Mordecai is reminding her that although she is queen, And she's living this plush, sheltered life, you know, inside the palace. And she's got servants and a walk-in closet full of Prada. Listen, she is still Jewish. And this decree applies to her. And even if somehow she just sits back and she somehow escapes it, those closest to her will not. Her people will not. And he asked her to find some courage. To not back down. To not ignore it. To not take the easy way out that who knows, perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this. You see, the opposite of courage is not fear. It's self-preservation, right? You've experienced this. It's wanting to protect ourselves. Like just stay comfortable, stay good, shield ourselves from anything. I love what Dr. Karen H. Job says about Esther, which I think is so true of her and of me and of us. It says that she, Esther, had to overcome herself in order to do what God had created her and positioned her to do. She had to overcome herself. You ever been there? in order to do what God had created her and then positioned her to do. You see, here's the deal. We can refuse to obey God. We can cower in fear from the calling that he's placed on our lives. And listen, God's still going to accomplish his plan. Just like Mordecai said, if you don't do this, I believe God's going to rise up some other way from some other place. But listen, here's what happens. We pass up the fulfillment of our own life purpose. And what God wanted to do in and through us and this incredible work that God, how God wanted to use our lives and we miss it. And maybe those closest to us miss it. Irving McManus puts it this way. He says, if you wait for guarantees, the only thing that will be guaranteed is that you will miss endless divine opportunities. We all want miracles and then we spend our lives avoiding the context in which miracles happen. And we need to take courage to step out of self-preservation to overcome ourselves, to take courage. Listen, if you are a parent watching today, you're you're a new parent, you're a parent of an elementary kid, middle school, junior high, high school student, man, that can be scary. Not a lot of certainties. We just dropped our oldest off at college last week. Not a lot of certainties in this life when it comes to parenting. It would be so easy to just kind of just back off, hands off, see how things go. Listen, listen. Lean in right now. Lean in. Listen. Step into this place that God has positioned you. Be courageous. Have the hard conversations because you are the parent of that girl, of that boy for such a time as this. And if you're some sort of boss or a business leader, maybe you run your own business, and then nothing has been wilder than this year. And things have been hard and things have been tight. And you know that maybe you could make things a little more cozy if you just fudge some numbers some different places. If you were just a little dishonest, it could be easier. Don't settle for that. Be courageous. You are that boss. You are that leader. For such a time as this, it's where God has you positioned. Listen, if you're a student watching and and nothing feels normal, but you still got virtual class, you still got teammates, you still got things going on and you know that God is asking you to courageously live for him and it's so different than so many of your friends. Listen, don't just take a pass on 2020. You are positioned in this place for such a time as this. Be bold, be different, live God's way. You have no idea the way he could use you right now in the middle of this. Maybe for some of you, you've been sensing for a while now that God has been asking you to do something and it seems a little risky, right? The timing's just not right. It would make things so uncomfortable. Listen, don't think for a second that God wouldn't ask something risky of you. He 
would. And who knows? You just may be the man. You must just may be the woman for such a time as this. See, courage is always a choice. Esther had a choice, which brings us to scene four, Braveheart. Like after hearing what Mordecai had to say, there's this change in Esther. You know, and she sent back a message telling Mordecai to have the Jewish people fast and pray for her for three days. And let me just be real. Let's not underestimate the importance of having some people pray for us when we need some courage. And then she said, when that is done, when this is done, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Man, you talk about a shift. A a choice to be courageous. In five tiny little verses, if you're reading this out of your Bible, she goes from, oh, no, 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 no. There is no way. This is too big of an ass. This is too risky. This is too much. This isn't a real good time. I could die for just approaching him to, I will go to the king even though it's against the law. And if I die, I die. Five tiny verses, she goes from self-preservation to absolute courage. And listen, she could have chickened out. She was queen. She could have stayed comfortable in her royal room. She could have played it safe, but she doesn't. And listen, for you and I, no matter how many opportunities we may have missed, no matter how many times we may have been a chicken, no matter how inadequate or underqualified we may feel, no matter how much of our lives we've already lived in this like self-preservation mode, we too may be one brave decision away from the most important turn on our entire path. That whatever our past is, whatever our background is, we may be one courageous decision away from breaking that old storyline and starting a brand new chapter of the narrative. Our stories can change too, just like Esther. I love when she says in verse 16, if I perish, then I perish. I did a Bible study years ago um, by Beth Moore that used this exercise and I love it and I just wanna walk us through it. Like using that sentence, it's kind of a fill in the blank with if I perish, then I perish. The sentence looks like this, if blank, then blank. I just want you to think about this for a moment. In that first blank, think about a fear you've got. Maybe you want to write it down right now. If blank, it could be your worst fear, could be a current fear, like something that's happening right now in your life, could be a reoccurring fear that just keeps popping its head up. But but think about a fear that you've got and put it in that first blank that if blank happens, If that fear happened, let me just tell you what our enemy wants us to think about that fear. He wants us to focus on it. He wants it to mess with us. He wants us to start to believe that if blank ever happened, oh man, we would just be done. If blank ever happened, we would never recover. We would never get back up if blank ever happened. You got any of those kind of fears? I've got a few of those fears where I think, man, if that happened, I don't even know how I would recover, how I'd get back up, you know, from my bedroom floor. But here's the deal. When we begin to believe that about our fears, that if they came to be, that we would just be done, we put conditional trust on a God who is bigger than our blank. We can't just trust him to help us avoid what we fear the most. No, we trust him no matter what, even if blank happens. This is what we have to put in that second blank. If blank, then God. If my worst fear happens, then God. He will be enough for me. He's going to pick me back up off that bedroom floor. He will be all that he says he is and do all that he's promised to do. He will be my strength. He will give me grace. If blank happens, then I may be hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but never abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed because my God is bigger than my blank and I will trust him. If blank, then God. Esther had made that decision that no matter what happened, God had her. And she resolved that she was not done, which brings us to scene five, pardon the interruption. Esther's now calling the shots. 
right? Mordecai told her what to do, but not how to do it. In fact, he told her to go to the king and to beg. But, but Esther decides to embrace where God has positioned her. She doesn't come as a beggar. She doesn't even get dressed in negligee. She comes dressed in the royal robes as the queen of the Persian empire. And she starts walking down that hall towards him. Can you imagine? knowing in every step she was getting closer to her possible death. Can you imagine? But she just kept putting one foot in front of the other. She's walking in faith. She's walking in courage. And maybe the only thing you need to hear today is keep taking the next right step. As she comes into view, there are the guards And they're ready to strike. Like it's their job to know she's breaking the law. And they know what the punishment should be. But then the king stops them. And guess what he does? He holds out the gold scepter. And he asks her, Queen Esther, what do you want? Ask and it's yours. And she says, well, if it pleases the king, let the king together with Haman. You remember him? Our our villain? Come today to a banquet I have prepared for him. So the king calls Haman and they go to this banquet and they're just eating and the king asks again, what is it, Queen Esther, what is it that you want? And she says, well, if it pleases the king, maybe you could come to another banquet tomorrow with Haman. And the king agrees to show up the next day. And and the tension's kind of building here. And there are all kinds of thoughts and and theories on why Esther didn't make her request at the first banquet. Some people think she completely chickened out, or maybe the king was in a mood and she didn't want to bring it up. Or or maybe she was just trying to make the king jealous, like she keeps inviting Haman, and he's like, why is she inviting Haman to all of our dinners? Some think she was just brilliant and she wanted to intrigue the king further. But whatever happened, whatever the reason, the king did leave the banquet intrigued. Like, what does she want? Esther left that banquet walking in courage for the next day, but Haman, our villain, he left this banquet on cloud nine. Like he's so puffed up about having dinner with the royal family and being the only one invited and then invited again. It says he left the banquet happy and in high spirits, but all of that changed when he had to walk past the king's gate and see Mordecai there refusing to bow to him. So Haman comes home and he gets all his friends together, his wife's there, he's just bragging. He's like, I had this great dinner with the king and queen. I'm the only one they invited. I get to go back tomorrow. My day was amazing until I had to pass by Mordecai the Jew. Can't stand that guy. Can't believe he won't bow to me. And so his wife Zeresh in Esther 514 and all of his friends there just say, hey, we got an idea. Have a gallows built. 75 feet high and asked the king in the morning to have Mordecai hanged on it. Then you can go to the king to this dinner and be happy. Well, this suggestion delighted Haman and so he had the gallows built. Scene six, sleepless in Susa. Esther 6, one, that night the king had trouble sleeping. So he ordered an attendant to bring the book of history of his reign. You remember that? So it could be read to him. So the king's having trouble sleeping and he's like, you know what, I just need a bedtime story. How about one that's all about me, all about my reign? And so they bring out the book of history of his reign, but guess which account was read? It was the one about Mordecai saving the king's life from those two guards, Bigthana and Teresh, who were plotting to kill him. And so the king asked the attendants who were reading, hey, what reward or recognition did we ever give Mordecai for this? Well, none, they said. Nothing was ever done for him. Then the king heard someone in the outer court. The king said, like, who's in the court? Like, it's early morning. I'm having trouble sleeping. Well, now Haman had just entered the outer court of the palace to speak to the king about hanging Mordecai on the gallows he had erected for him. See, like, this is good stuff here in our Bible. And so he asked Haman, the king asked Haman, hey, I got you here. You're my right-hand guy. What should I do for someone I want to honor? And Haman thought, well, who would the king want to honor other than me? He said, I would like bring him the royal robe, put him on the king's horse, put a royal crest on his head, lead him through the streets with the nobles and the princes shouting, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Excellent, the king said to Haman. Quick, take my robes and my horse and do just as you have said for Mordecai the Jew who sits at the gate of the palace, leave out nothing you have suggested. And Haman had to do it. Man, I wish I could have been there. Afterward, Mordecai returned to the palace gate, but Haman hurried home 
dejected and completely humiliated. So we're going to name our next scene after him, scene seven, the biggest loser. Haman is like humiliated, dejected. He's reeling a little bit how his plan is coming unraveled. But then he goes to this banquet with the king and the queen. And there again, the king says, Esther, what is it that you want? Ask and it's yours. And there in courage, Esther says, if I have found favor with you, grant me this. Spare my life, spare my people, for we have been sold for destruction, slaughter, and annihilation. And the king says, who? Where is the man who would dare do such a thing? And Esther replied, this wicked Haman is our adversary and our enemy. And Haman grew pale with fright before the king and queen. Well, the king gets up in a rage Right? This is his highest ranking official. He, he did not see this coming. He goes out into the garden. He's trying to cool off a little bit. And while he's out in the garden, Haman falls on the couch and begins to beg Esther for his life. And it says in despair, he falls on the couch where Queen Esther was reclining just as the king was returning from the palace garden. Okay, listen, this sets the king off. He was like, get off my wife kind of moment. He even said, will he even molest the queen while she's in my house? Like, it is not looking good for Haman. And one of the attendants standing nearby, seeing the king's rage, has a suggestion. He says, you know what I saw on the way to work today? A gallows, 75 feet high. It stands by Haman's house. He had it made for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. The king said, hang him on it. So they hanged Morde Haman on the gallows he had prepared for Mordecai. I mean, come on. That is unreal. Which brings us to our final scene, scene eight, hero. On that same day, the king gave Esther all of Haman's estate, and she put Mordecai over it. But because the king had already signed the edict against the Jews, he couldn't revoke it. So he had Mordecai write up a new one that was translated to all the provinces, and it was delivered. That it said on March 7th, every Jew in every city had the right to assemble and now protect themselves to destroy or kill any armed force or nationality or province that might attack them. And so on March 7th, the two decrees of the king are put into effect. And on that day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, but quite the opposite happened. It was the Jews who overpowered their enemies. Against all odds. Scene 8 is called heroes. And while both Esther and Mordecai displayed some courageous heroics, the real hero in this story is never mentioned. One of the most intriguing things about the book of Esther, if you're ever studying this book of the Bible, is that God's name is never mentioned in it. But don't confuse God's name not being in it with God not being in it, because he is all over this story. And just like with every great drama, behind the scenes, there is a writer, a producer, a director who knows every scene, who is involved in every line, and is in complete control of the story. I mean, could it just so happen that Vashti is banished at a time when Esther's at the right age to be chosen for tryouts? Could it just so happen after four years of searching for a new queen, the new queen that's chosen happens to be a Jewish girl? Could it just so happen that, that while it is against the law and the king didn't have a reputation for tolerating disrespectful wives, Esther wins his favor with that gold scepter? Could it just so happen while a plot is being carried out to kill Mordecai, the king has a sleepless night and his bedtime story is about Mordecai saving his life? Could it just so happen that all of this story would take place at a time when the Jewish community was scattered and displaced, that they would come together again and be strong? No, that is God. That is God working behind the scenes and everything. And I believe that God chose to inspire this book without his name ever being mentioned in it so that you and I could take courage. Maybe you've even experienced this before where you've been through a season in your life and you couldn't figure out how God was working, what God was doing. But now you look back on it and you can see his hand was all over it. He was working. Or maybe it's right now whatever you're going through in your life right now, and you cannot figure out where God is in your story. You can't seem to find his involvement. I believe he gave us this book in this way, this story in this way, so that we could know even when we can't see him on the page, he is with us. He is here. He is with you right now. 
don't be afraid. You are not alone. You see, if we want to live lives that are kind of against all odds, if we want to live courageous lives, here's what we got to know. We don't have to be the hero. The hero is already at work. The hero is always at work. We just have to be willing to trust him, to follow him, and to say yes to the role he's asking us to play for such a time as this. front of us today, whatever time it is in our lives, God, that you would help us step out in faith. God, that we would pray this prayer and we would move. Let's pray together. my 
我。